Hi everybody, welcome back. We are picking up lesson 10A and applying the loads. Remember the loads were normal to the arch. Let's refresh our memory on what it looks like in the perturbed configuration. So we've got that through the techniques of the previous lesson. What we want to do then is test our script. We did that at the end of the last lesson, and now we're here. Uh, supposing that there is a known load, and in this wind example, I am pushing perpendicular to the surface. We call that a normal force. It is a force per length because it's wind, and yes, I know that pressure is force per length squared, but we take a slice in and out of the page to come up with a single value for force per length, which takes into account the depth in and out of the page. If that made your head hurt, don't worry about it. The loads are given to us. However, we must replace distributed loads with equivalent concentrated loads. The way we do that is by calculating the magnitude of the force, which is force per length multiplied by length. And we put it at the midpoint of the segment the fancy word for midpoint is centroid because it's a uniform distribution. If the distribution was not uniform, but increasing, we would have to find the centroid of that known shape. The key word here is known. We always know the loads. One more thing on this slide. I'm on slide 14 of the PowerPoint that the loads do not change orientation during the perturbation. That is something that we experienced with gravity loads very clearly because the loads never felt like they could be anything except vertical. But here I am not doing gravity. I am pushing perpendicular to the surface. So I drew these lines for F1 and F2 and I explain, I hope quite clearly, that F1 is force per length multiplied by the distance segment one. And force two is the same force per length multiplied by the distance segment two. Those are placed at the center point, the midpoint, the centroid, of the distribution, which happens to be halfway along the length of the segment. So far, so good. In the perturbed shape, how are those forces oriented? That's why I drew those long lines. And the answer is that those forces are not to be imagined as being perpendicular to the perturbed shape. If that seems difficult and paradoxical to you, I suggest that you consider small displacements where it really doesn't matter at all. If, if, if the delta is small, then we're all happy together. But if delta is large, I want you to see the correct way of doing it which is that the loads are defined by their orientation on the unperturbed shape. In other words, the load uh, might look like this if it was perpendicular, and we don't do that. We have it parallel to the original loads and parallel to the original load on the next segment. Those were not great drawings. 
let's look at it in a neater presentation. Here I drew a parallel line from the unperturbed segments over to the perturbed segments. I'll show you how I did that. And I simply mimicked the load on the perturbed structure. Okay. Why am I making such a big, such a big deal about that? Because the loft must be defined in the direction of the original load. That's why I'm making a big deal about it because I want you to calculate the loft along this axis for F1 and along this axis for F2. And that's what I did here. So I'll show you how I did it. I think it's pretty efficient and quick. If you think of something faster, fine, but I don't think you should use trigonometry to do that. I think you should use geometry to do that. So here I have a large perturbation for the left vertical reaction. And I'm not super accurate for my answer because I do have a theoretical solution. But as the perturbation gets smaller, the answer becomes nearly truth with a capital T. Here's another image of the same problem. And hopefully you'll see, oh, here, this is a little better. I ghosted the original load. I think this looks a little better. And then uh, I got a really nice agreement uh, between the vertical reaction theoretically compared to the vertical reaction using the modern Mueller-Breslau method. So uh, one more slide in the PowerPoint and then we'll jump over to the computer program. So what I'd like you to do is make delta very large draw an arch that is made up of two crooked pieces, <laughs> two bent pieces, so four straight segments. I would like you to apply, apply some uniform force per length, as I did here, that is projected normal to at least one of the segments of the arch. Or you could do it to two or more, it doesn't matter, but do it for at least one and get one of the external reactions. Maybe try something different to be brave, like a horizontal reaction. Uh, if we have time, we have time. That's all we have is time. Um, I might do a horizontal one for you. We'll see. I might forget to do a horizontal one for you. Let's look at the script that I wrote. Here it is. And I think this is where we left off last time. So I said you could test your program by wiggling it. That may have been, you know, slightly distasteful to you. Uh, we could check it a little more rigorously by checking those angles. Remember, those angles are a product of the key points that I decided to place. So I will hit angle here, and I will select three points. If you go in the wrong direction, you'll get the exterior angle, but engineers always use the interior angle of the arch. I never ever want the angle at the crown. Don't ever calculate that for me or for yourself. Let's see if that unusual angle, 142.7 degrees, is replicated in the perturbed configuration. And lo and behold, it is replicated perfectly. Now, I never use that angle, never, but I, ensured that my script is exactly 
replicating the original shape. Let's try it on the right side just for fun. 138.37, what a funny number. Imagine telling your fabricator, I want 138.37 degrees. I demand that, else I will smite you. Yeah, you know, we don't talk like that to our fabricators. They might smite us. Okay, so everything is perfect. Let's look at the loads. I think I said they were something like 200, right? Something like 200. So let's say force per length is 200. There's nothing magic about 200. I just thought if you want to debug your programs, you could check my number. So there's force per length at 200. Let's get the midpoint of segment one. There it is. Uh, we could call that load point one. That's, there's no problem with that at all. And then you could see it, but we're not going to do the algebraic trick of y of load point one prime minus y of load point one. Can you see why we won't do that? Yes, you're absolutely correct because the load is not vertical. We need the loft in the direction of the force. So what I'm suggesting is, what I'm suggesting is this, draw a segment that is in the direction of the original force. Now, how do, how do we do that? Um, lots of ways, I suppose. What I will do is draw a perpendicular line to segment one. And now I will draw a line parallel to that through the second load point. And you could see they coincide perfectly if delta is zero, but they remain parallel regardless of the delta. I don't think I put the delta in here yet. So let's put the delta in. We need the delta. Let's just do it graphically. We'll, we will rename that segment as delta. I don't need the number. Now, what is the loft? The loft is the distance along that line. You don't have to draw the arrows. You don't have to draw the arrows. You can just by making a circle. The radius will be F1 divided by the force scale, whatever scale you need. But I think the lines are almost better because you really see that it's parallel. Now, how do I get that distance? Well, I think the best way to do it, and maybe you have a better way, is to draw a line parallel to segment one. You don't have to do that part, but you have to do the next part. And then a line parallel to segment one through the second load point. Let's hide the force lines. And now you'll see what I'm driving at. I, I'm going to put a, a little point here. I'll put it on this line and I'll put it on this line. And, and you'll see immediately what I'm doing. Now, I want a line perpendicular to these. Maybe I'll put one more point on there. I will draw a line perpendicular to the point that I just put in and I will find the intersection with the second line. That's why I drew a line there because lines are infinite. Let's get that intersect. Did you wanna say boom? I didn't say boom. Let's put this segment in here and call that loft one. That's a great name because I have force one. So loft one is great. Now, why is, why did I 
put a couple more dots there, you'll see why right now. I did that for looks. Look how nice that is. Maybe, maybe like this. What do you think? You know, that's pretty convincing graphically. I am so fussy. It's got to be four point. Okay, that's pretty convincing graphically, right? I think you could come back to your script six months from now, six years from now, maybe, and say, oh, the loft is perpendicular to the first segment. Or it's normal to the first segment. Maybe that's a great way of saying it, a little more mathematical. Here's the delta, right? No, sorry, that's delta. Uh, you could pull this around. If you don't like the lines that I just drew and you say, oh my gosh, there's so many points, how can I adjust the length of the line? Fear not, fear not. Hold your mouse here and it's saying, well, it's defined by two points. Let's go find those two points. There's one and there's the other. Don't delete them. Hide them. And that's what I mean a little bit by your personal style, right? That you start to develop your own personal style of programming geometric, parametric, algorithmic scripts. Ooh, my dairy science students are swooning at this point. My ag business students are swooning. My engineering students say, ah, we do that for breakfast. Okay. I think it's super visual, super cool. Uh, let me add one more thing that I don't know if you need it or not, but you get your money's worth with me. So let's hide this here. Let's put a segment in here. Let's call that segment radius. Uh, centroid one. Why did I do that? I want to draw a circle with center and radius centered on left prime and the radius will be radius centroid one. And look at that. It became exactly passing through what I rapidly put down as the midpoint of the load. This radius technique is what we did before, remember? Yes, you remember. Thank you for remembering. You don't have to do this when it's uniformly distributed over the entire length, but you do have to do this if you have a concentrated load placed somewhere randomly along uh, the structure. All right, we're a little bit um, away from the end of the study. I almost said problem. We don't have problems. We have solutions. Let's just get the midpoints here really quick. Let's change the color. Change the style, make it a little more visible. I don't need to rename them. If I was using numbers to calculate loss, then I could take the X values and the Y values and all that. But who wants to do all that? That's a lot of work. Can you walk through how to get the loft for the second load? Can you do that in your head right now, really fast? I won't even ask you to pause. I'm just going to keep talking while you're thinking. Is that bothering you while I'm talking while you're thinking? Go, 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 go. What am I doing? Yes, I heard you think. Parallel line to the second segment. Take that, pass it through that next point. Drop a point on one of those lines. Doesn't matter where. Get a perpendicular. Find the other point on the other line. 
draw a segment make it four point call that loft two and you could put the little dashed lines in there if you want Or you could just put it in here if you don't want to put those little dashed lines in. Okay. I think it's great. Uh, and then <clears throat> we are a hop, skip, and a jump away from solving this. I don't think I have the forces yet. No, I only have one number on here, force per length. So let's get F1 is force per length multiplied by that length, which is segment one. You don't have to say length of segment one. You just use the name. You know that. You're faster than me now, I bet, right? Force per length times segment two. Looking good. Reaction left. Y is parentheses. Uh, we've done this many times. You see that the load is going one way and the loft is going the other way for both F1 and F2. Therefore, they are both negative on the left-hand side of the equation. Therefore, they are both positive on the right-hand side of the equation. Standard stuff. I see you in the coffee shop just kind of casually ordering espressos while your engineering friends are losing their marbles trying to solve this because an espresso is at stake. You've already ordered yours because you know you're going to win this competition. You know it. You've got to have faith. I think the theory was 1866. Remember that number? I'm looking pretty confident here. I think I won the espresso. I'll call it 1865.35. <laughs> Make sure you give a caveat to your competitor that, um, say within, let's get it within 1% or something on a napkin. Not on a napkin. You could do this on a napkin. You won't get it within 1%. Oh, uh, why not? Because you would have to draw a fairly large perturbation. Um, a quick, if you're really competing, and you should, uh, maybe use 10? 10 seems really big, right? Uh, but it's easy to divide by 10. So F1 times loft 1 plus F2 times loft 2 divided by 10. You could almost do that in your head. I bet you'd get, I don't know what you'd get. What would you get here? Let's see. That's not 10%. Sorry. That's not even, <laughs> that's nowhere near. Uh, it was 1866 and uh, I got 1591 here. Ooh, what if you did Delta? I, I want you to win. Anyway, it's about the journey, not about the destination, right? If you did five, we're rigging the contest. I love it. Mm. Well, you better use your GeoGebra. You know, you can get it on your phone too, but when I do it on the phone, I just lose my mind. I think we're done, right? Uh, what else should I do here? Let's talk about the deliverables that you must deliver to me. Uh, here I did... Um, just some sensitivity studies messing around. I think we saw all this already. Okay, what do I want? Uh, before what I, I tell you what I want, let's recap the whole 
process visually in our mind's eye, verbally as an intellectual exercise. All right, let's back up. You're building some gigantic, beautiful vaulted space. Make it big. You can pick the key points, the point on the elbow, the point on the crown, the right landing point. It could be at different elevations. You must find the new crown. That has nothing to do with the shape of the arch. Nothing at all. We've done a couple lessons already on that. It has only to do with those two chords. Get those two chords to establish the new crown. Then chords are your friends. Use chords to establish the elbow. So figure out the chord from the original point to the elbow and recreate that on the perturbed point and then get the next chord from the crown to the elbow and start at the perturbed crown and get the elbow on the left side and the right side, okay? Uh, and then the last sentence in the summary, loads never change orientation. And we talked a lot about that today with the parallel lines. You don't have to draw the big red arrows. You can if you want, it's not really hard. I would like you to recreate a four straight segment, two member arch. It could be uh, asymmetric, it could be, but make it big and grandiose and dramatic because we love drama. Apply some normal pressure to at least one segment, just like I did. Solve for one particular reaction, anything you want anything you want. Now, do we have time to mess around with a horizontal perturbation? I think we have time. I promised you I would uh, do it. I didn't practice it. I never practice, you know. Let's see if I could do it on the fly. Okay, suppose we wanted, oops, I'm in PowerPoint. Suppose we wanted, am I sharing PowerPoint? Yes, I am. Here we go. Suppose we wanted, uh, I'm, uh, demo. suppose we wanted, I'm nervous about losing things. I'm going to delete left prime and then everything should go. Okay. So I saved everything. I think we're good. And this was a demo anyway. Let's move left prime inwards. Ho, ho. Ho, ho. I'll put a point on the axis since everything's on the horizontal axis anyway. I won't do the whole problem. I don't want to get you tired or anything. But it's really pretty quick since I have cord to the crown from the left support and cord to the crown from the right support. So if I call this left prime, I am really close to getting the new crown really close. Who can get it faster, me or you? Oh, I think you're going to win. I think you're going to win. There's one circle, radius, cord to the crown on the left side. Here's another circle, cord to the crown on the right side where they intersect, boom, that's the new crown. You beat me. But you could see that it's really not 
hard. I mean, a lot of what we do is hard, but this part is just gorgeous, right? It's just, I don't know, I think it's beautiful. Okay, that's that. Uh, I think you know what to do next. Uh, how do I get the knuckle or the elbow? You need um, that segment one, which is the cord from left to the elbow. Segment one, that's centered on left prime. And then another one centered on crown prime. Now I didn't rename that, but uh, because I think I have a crown prime. Center and radius here, and that is segment two because it's the second segment. And you see where the knuckle is or the elbow. And you could check those angles. You could check those angles, but that's a lot of clicking. I love just wiggling it until I see it exactly coincides with the unperturbed situation. And then I feel like I've tested my algorithm. Okay. So that looks, looks good, but you don't know for sure until you do the wiggling uh, along the horizontal. You're only perturbing one motion at a time, okay? So that really is enough, I think, to get you going on the whole lesson. It was a little shorter video for this one, but lots of content, lots of excitement. Looking forward to your magnificent vaulted structures. Good luck.